Thank you so much, everyone, for your time and patience. And of course, a very warm welcome to our panelists uh, today. We'll be taking a deep dive into regional corridors. Uh, we'll be looking at their strategic importance, uh, like Dr. Dictioner mentioned earlier, in connecting Africa. I know that there are some transformational ongoing projects that are going on at the moment, and so we'd like to just get a feel, just a sense of how much progress is being made and how it is these projects or the potential of these projects to transform Africa in the context of connectivity. I'll start with, a, with Mr. Diodone Dukundane, Minister of uh, Infrastructure. Honorable Minister, Burundi uh, plays a key role in the central corridor under which you are developing a 900 kilometer electrified standard gauge railway uh, transport system between Burundi, the Democratic Republic, of Congo and the port of Dar el Salaam in Tanzania. Now, considering Burundi's strategic position in the Central Corridor, could you tell us the strategic importance and economic benefits of this SGR project, particularly in the context of the trade enhancement under the African Continental Free Trade Area? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear moderator, and uh, uh, allow me first of all to uh, uh, sincerely commend the initiators of this uh, forum, the Africa Investment Forum. Uh, this platform is unique in the sense that uh, it's not only a venue for people to come and uh, participate, speak and go, but it allows people really to make deals and uh, transact. So uh, on this, I think uh, my country, the Republic of Burundi, should join her voice to commend uh, the African Rem Bank, President Adesina, his team, the co-founders uh, for this initiative. Secondly, uh, we benefited uh, as a country, as a region, uh, the Central Corridor region. Uh, these are five member states, Tanzania, Burundi, the RC1 and Uganda. We already uh, secured last year through uh, the previous forum uh, funding uh, to develop our railway a project that links Tanzania to Burundi, and um, the deal reached uh, nearly uh, 700 million US dollars. And uh, since then, last year, we embarked on uh, procurement. And uh, as we are talking now, we reached the stage uh, of shortlisting contractors to build this railway line. I, I think this is a major step towards uh, implementing this project. Uh, but also, uh, as uh, President Adesina was highlighting just a while ago, it's not a matter of building a railway or a road, it's a matter of making an impact. And our railway project, uh, linking Burundi and Tanzania uh, in the DRC, uh, is a major route towards huge mineral deposits that exist in our region, in Burundi, DRC, and Tanzania. And also on this angle, we have made uh, progress in terms of securing the future uh, uh, company that will extract these minerals. So we believe that uh, in the next few months, may, maybe early next year, 2024, we will be talking of another story where the concrete activities on the ground would have happened. Now, lastly, to come back to your question, why should we be proud of talking of this SGR? Why shouldn't we um, uh, do business as usual, build roads in the last five, six decades? We've been investing in roads. But this time around, we came to realize that uh, failing to invest in the standard gas railway has been costly to our economy. Take some figures. We are a country that is located at 1,500 kilometers away from the seaport of Dar es Salaam. When you undertake a return trip, this makes 300 kilometers. And uh, relying on roads means that you only carry 25 or 28 tons over a distance of 3,000 kilometers. But when you do the comparison with a railway in place, it will help us to save nearly $100 per ton. And if you are running a business of nearly a million tons per year, you understand that we will be saving not less than 70 million US dollars only by using railway. In other words, if we don't do so, we'll be losing the same amount. So in the next 10 years, actually, we would have lost nearly a billion dollars, and this is exactly the amount that is needed to be the railway. 
So it's high time, and uh, uh, I believe uh, the audience should agree with us that uh, uh, Africa has no choice. If we are to go continental, if we are to really embark on the free trade uh, 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 continental area with its benefits across the continent, there is no other alternative. Actually, if we don't do so, Africa will continue to depend on the rest of the world in terms of international trade because so far it makes it easier or less costly to transact with China or America while the intra-African uh, trade is still at very low levels. So we really believe that this experience among others that we've been hearing in the platform will transform Africa and our country is committed. Allow me before I conclude to just inform the, plat the, the audience that uh, this central corridor actually that connects the port of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania to the other four countries under the coordination of the Central Corridor Transit Transport Facilitation Agency, actually the initiative started way back in uh, 2010. And uh, over the last 15 years, an initiative led by the African Development Bank has helped the five countries to reach a river whereby we have got border posts and now the African Development Bank is coming on board again, committing nearly a billion US dollars, 0.5 uh, billion US dollars to help the same countries to advance their agenda. So I think I may stop by there by again emphasizing on the need of railway if we are to transform the African continental uh, trade uh, objectives. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency Dukundani, and we appreciate, of course, you, the commitment and just being resolute in ensuring that uh, these projects are constructed, even though uh, financing continues to be a constraint. Let's move on to uh, Angola. Uh, Your Excellency Ivan Santos, Angola plays a central role in the Lobito Corridor, hosting the port of uh, Lobito, which is integral to the connectivity and functionality of this uh, region artery, uh, if you will. Now, one of the objectives of the regional transboundary corridors uh, is to catalyze investments in domestic production and to revive, very importantly now, the private sector. Could you describe the plans of the government of Angola to invest in agriculture and agribusiness uh, along the Lobito corridor and how it intends to uh, leverage uh, the logistics infrastructure to increase exports of agricultural commodities? Very important. Thank you, yes, uh, for your question. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, allow me, as I, before I respond to your question, to do an overview about uh, our highway. Uh, the highway was built in the early of 19th and was used to transport the copper from Zambia Copper Belt to the coast. Wherever uh, the highway fell into disrepair during the Civil War back in Angola. After rehabilitation work, the corridor was open again, and an agreement between three countries, Angola, Zambia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, providing more effective and efficient route between the three countries, uh, both by sea and by, by land. But to operate this, this corridor, we have a consortium from three companies. One is Transfigura from Switzerland, uh, the second one is Motengil from Portugal, and the last one is Venturis from Belgium. Uh, the partnership is also expected to bring more, create more jobs and uh, in regional integration. Just to tell you, for example, we in SADEC are about uh, almost 500 million people. It's important to integrate all, all the countries here in, in Africa. Well, to ensure the success of the Lobito Corridor, Angola has implemented a set of reforms and measures. For example, we are investing a lot in capital assets, uh, speaking on the budget side, and public-private partnership, and facilitating foreign investment. For example, uh, improving our handle at the port of Lubito, CSI, uh, with around seven specialized terminal, improving our Benguela highways, uh, international airport around the corridor of Lubito, and mainly three principles, uh, main roads around the co corridor of Lubito, national roads, trying to, to revamp, to improve our connectivity around the corridor of Lubito. We are improving our, uh, our policies that promote partnership between states and private players, 
to, uh, in order to ensure more sustainable and effective business. Signature of agreement between Angola and the European Union and the Global uh, Gateway Program, I think was in the last October. Uh, an agreement as well, evaluating 300 million USD with, between Angola and World Bank uh, to maximize the potential of Lobito Corridor, a project called Diversifica Mash in Portuguese, which we abbreviate as D. Uh, to accelerate the process of economic diversification back in Angola, job creation through sm micro, small, and medium sized enterprises in no oil sectors, for sure, and mainly leading, leading by humans trying to bring more uh, gender equality is the main focus. But uh, in the agribusiness side, and to pursue our food security, and in line as well with uh, Dakar 2, the government approved in three, three big plans. One is the plan ground, which is the plan for grain, okay. cereals. Uh, the second one is the plan pecuaria to produce more livestock, animal protein, because, for example, back in Angola, we import a lot of livestock around 500 million by year just in livestock. And the last one is Plana Pesca, which is for fishing, trying to produce more fishing. Regarding to Plana Ground, which is more agro, uh, the Plana Ground is going to benefit a lot for Corridor of Lubito. Uh, because can become the main route to transport and export the grains, the cereals, and making the life easier for investors and exporters. Uh, well, um, business-wise, is more profitable to be around Corridor of Lobito. But for any companies can be part of that, can participate on Lobito Highway project in many ways, such as construction, uh, provide the service to Bengala Highway project, uh, hauling stock, providing locomotive, wagons for Bengala Highway project, tele tele telecom systems, uh, bring uh, the lastest technology around the corridor of Lubito for small and medium-sized enterprise, finance service as well for medium, uh, all companies around the corridor of Lubito, and the most important, investing in agribusiness because the corridor of Lubito is going to provide a lot, a lot of opportunities to transport and to export the product for agribusiness. We are promoting Plana Ground, which is the cereals trying to, to, to pursue our food security. Uh, all value chains of Plana Ground uh, and upstream, medium stream, and downstream. Uh, that's it for now. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, before we move on, just a quick note. Uh, after this conversation, which will last about 40 minutes, uh, we will have a 10 minutes to go into a Q&A a session where audience uh, will have the opportunity to ask questions to, to our panelists today. So let's uh, move things on quickly. Your Excellency Dr. Peter Matuki, let's uh, take a view from a perspective from the East African community. Uh, the EAC has been at the forefront of regional uh, integration initiatives demonstrating a commitment to developing regional uh, economic corridors. So here's my question. Could you elaborate on the primary drivers of success that the EAC has identified and leveraged on in spearheading the development of regional economic corridors, that's one. And also, what lessons uh, could be shared with other regional uh, economic communities to facilitate, very important now, continent-wide success? Thank you very much. Let me start by appreciating the invitation by the African Development Bank, but also for organizing this very important forum. But also thank the um, government of Morocco for the warm reception accorded to us since we arrived here in Marrakesh. Our East African community is one of the building blocks of the African Union and uh, very fast growing, expanding. Currently, now with seven partner states, we have DRC as the latest member of the East African community. We have Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, South Sudan, Burundi Republic, and Rwanda, and uh, Uganda. And this is seven. That is a market of around 300 million people. And in this November, we are likely to admit Somalia into the community. And that means now the coastline of the East African community now goes to almost four, five, uh, 5,000 kilometers stretching. And that will be important for us. But looking at the community itself is people-centered. 
everything we do is demand driven by the people and uh, is private sector led. Private sector led meaning that we believe regional integration succeeds if we are private sector as the engine of regional integration. And looking at the four pillars of our regional integration, the customs union, which is the first pillar, and that is about movement of goods within the partner states of East Africa and the facilities that we put together to facilitate trade. That has really improved for the last uh, 10 years, the intra-trade within East Africa. Uh, now, currently, we started almost, it was below 10, now we're almost somewhere 20 percent intra-trade within uh, East Africa. In fact, last year uh, alone, 2022, we tr within the East African region, we traded to close to about 10 billion US dollars, thanks to the initiatives by putting in place to facilitate trade. But the second pillar, which is about the common market, movement of people, which again uh, facilitates movement, and this gain is driven by the fact that people would want to do business, people would want to move, we have made it possible that when you are moving from one country to another, you don't need to use a passport, you use your, your national ID, and that becomes easy for people. Moving from Kenya to Uganda, for example, or Kenya to Rwanda, you just need to use, use your national ID. A third pillar, which is monetary union, is the demand by the capital, by the business, a private sector saying, within the drink business, and to his, his or drink business within the region, it's important that we have a currency that facilitates that. And now we are in the process of identifying a common currency within the East Africa that would be able to support this uh, process. And then the ultimate pillar, which would be the political confederation. But I would want to say that um, the East African community, with, uh, with that, and we look forward to even more expansion, we are looking at Ethiopia that has shown interest in joining Djibouti. So at the end of the day, we are looking at a market of close to about 700 million people coming from the entire Horn of Africa. 700 million people, that is almost half of Africa's population. Now the East African community, right from the, the, the coast line of Indian Ocean to the Atlantic, and that is the East African community. And therefore it is inevitable that infrastructure is so critical now to connect these countries and the, and the businesses if we want really to move. And that is why in, uh, from where we see it as the East African community, it is necessary and also very urgent that um, we push the infrastructure agenda. Right. And I want to thank African Development Bank for that, for that kind of uh, support and drive that they, that they have. But most importantly is the fact that we have a strong private sector within uh, East Africa that, that is actually pushing the agenda and saying that we want to do business. And the people them say we want to move from one country to another. And those are some of the things that are motivating our integration as East African community, but also trying to say that if we want to take full advantage of the African free trade area, can we organize ourselves first as a regional economic bloc as East African community? So that together, we could be able even to support and leverage countries that may not be economically strong as others, and we approach the African continental free trade area as a regional economic bloc, right. and that is what we are trying to, to do. In terms of infrastructure and what we, we think all these things cannot be done without the infrastructure projects, right. the, 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 the central corridor, that um, the southern corridor that my brother is speaking about, the president of Tanzania spoke about it yesterday, and the northern corridor, that is runs from Mombasa and all the way to Uganda and ultimately to, 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 to Rwanda. And then the central, central corridor that runs from Dar es Salaam all the way to Uganda and the southern one that runs from Dar es Salaam, Burundi, and Admin to DRC. These are the things that we feel that we need to focus on so that we can increase intra-ESC trade, and that is basically where we are feeling as East African community. The deal is, let us invest in infra infrastructure. We may be late, but better late than never. You are absolutely right about that, Dr. Matsuki. A round of applause for him, please. Thank you so much for that. Let's move on quickly now. Uh, Ambassador Dr. Mohamed Kader, Assistant Secretary General at COMESA, this is my question to you. Could you please share your insights on how regional corridor projects align uh, with COMESA's strategic objectives and how they can contribute to the broader goal of enhancing the inter-regional trade and economic integration? Thank you very much. Um, well, first, allow me to um, uh, ref refer to our medium-term strategic plan, 
We have a medium-term strategic plan that runs for five years. The one we have currently is from 2021 to 2025. It has four substantive strategic pillars, um, market integration, productive integration, physical connectivity, infrastructure, and lastly, gender and social affairs. Um, infrastructure and regional corridors are of great importance in COMESA, in Africa in general. Um, some of the examples that have already been given are sourcing imports from countries as far as China, India, or Brazil, because it's in fact less expensive than sourcing them from within the continent. This is why we give uh, regional corridors high priority in COMESA. They fall under two of our four substantive strategic pillars, the one on physical infrastructure and connectivity, and the one on market integration. Um, in case of the ADB, the African Development Bank, we know about the high fives of the bank, and of course, regional corridors here relate closely to the high five on integrating Africa. In COMESA, we have 21 member states, almost half of the African continent. It's the biggest functional um, regional economic community in the continent. But we have nine landlocked countries in, out of the 21 countries. This is why developing regional corridors is of great importance in COMESA. But those corridors involve a lot more than just infrastructure. They involve trade facilitation, transport facilitation, institutional cooperation, international cooperation, and so on. At least from the perspective of COMESA, this is the case. When it comes to transport itself, infrastructure, the focus is on railway, road, and maritime transport. And in this case, in, in, under this um, factor, this uh, element, we need to ensure, always ensure interoperability as a bare minimum. Otherwise, we cannot have a regional corridor. When it comes to um, transport facilitation, we have developed a long experience with transport facilitation in Comesa, providing instruments, very practical instruments like a regional carrier license, um, third-party insurance scheme, um, and so on and, and so forth, a lot of uh, instruments for transport facilitation. Also trade facilitation, which is in fact a lot more important in, in Africa than tariff liberalization. Um, and in trade facilitation, we also have developed a lot of instruments. Uh, to give you one example, we have the so-called Regional Customs Transit Guarantee Scheme, which is a unique scheme in the continent, and now working very closely with the African continental free trade area to upscale it. Uh, corridors are usually linked, as we know, to seaports, specific seaports, because they have a lot to do with landlocked countries, transforming them to land-linked land countries instead of land-locked ones. Over 85% of traffic in regional corridors in, in, in Comesa and in Africa in general now is by road. And roads are very expensive. They are exposed to a lot of damage. And this is why our focus should be a shift to railways, which is the most affordable, economic, and safe mode of transport. Um, Comesa, as a member of tripartite free trade area, uh, has several corridors running in or through uh, the, the, the Iraq itself, including the North-South Corridor, the Central Corridor, the Northern Corridor. We have also developed several other corridors, bilateral ones, linking our member states. Other potential corridors that we are now looking at in COMESA in also cooperation with financial institutions like the African Development Bank is linking Lake Victoria with the Mediterranean Sea is Lake Tanganyika Transport Corridor okay. and uh, linking our island member states to the mainland continent, um, Africa, uh, mainland. Now allow me to make three very short messages at the end. One, regional corridors are essential for trade and regional integration in the continent. There is no doubt about this. The corridors are not only about transport, they are a lot about a lot more than transport, about transport facilitation, trade facilitation, and human mobility as well. Regional corridors should not be merely about 
transporting raw materials out of the continent, they should be used as platforms to build value chains. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohamed Kader, for that uh, very insightful. Let's move on quickly. Let's get a perspective uh, from the West uh, African uh, region. Uh, Mr. S Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Sediko Duka, given the, the strategic importance of the Abidjan Lagos Corridor Highway uh, in enhancing regional integration, trade, and economic growth across multiple uh, sectors in West Africa, and considering ECOWAS's uh, critical role in fostering regional integration in West Africa. Now, this is my question. How does ECOWAS envision its role and contribution in ensuring the successful implementation and operation of the Abidjan Lagos Corridor Highway? Okay, thank you very much. So, this project, Abidjan Lagos Corridor, involves five countries Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Ghana, and Côte d'Ivoire. It represents uh, 1,028 kilometers, and uh, also it represents 75% of trade volume in West Africa. It's passed uh, over major economic hubs like uh, Abidjan, Accra, Tema in Ghana, Lomé, Cotonou, and Lagos in Nigeria. And it has also a supranational status. Now, the role of ECOWAS, as you said, ECOWAS has been given the mandate to prepare and implement the project through the treaty that this country signed in collaboration with the five corridor member countries. So we have uh, preparatory activities, but before the project itself has an institutional and legal framework, there is a treaty signed by the head of state and government, ratified by all the countries. There is also an intergovernmental agreement. There is an international project agreement, uh, as well as what we call Abidjan Lagos Corridor Management Authority signed by the five ministers in charge of works and infrastructure. To the, this end, we set up a, a governance and implementation body. We have, for example, a ministerial steering committee, an expert meeting that we held three to four times a year. And uh, all the project implementation entities housed at ECOWAS and within each member country. We have also the role to mobilize resources to this end. We mobilize uh, 43 million US dollars to prepare that project, coming uh, where 60% uh, from African Development Bank, 33% from uh, European Union, and the eight is shared between ECOWAS Commission and uh, the member countries. So we carry out uh, Studies, feasibility studies, they are already completed. Uh, almost the detailed engineering studies are completed also. And uh, through these studies, the IRR is between 11 to 15 percent for a total cost of the project between 12 and uh, 15 billion US dollars. We have another component study on trade and uh, transport facilitation and another component on special development initiative. So we identify some project because, like uh, what the uh, commissar said, in fact, this project is not just about having a simple highway for movement or traffic of person and goods, but also it's an economic corridor, also it's a coordinated set of multi-modal transport, logistic and uh, infrastructure services. So we target some projects uh, around this corridor, like on a refinery, on a free zone, industrial zone, on extension of ports, on power station, on mining. Now the execution and funding. So the studies are not completed, but it will be, they, they will be completed by the end of this year. So there is several financing scheme to consider first through beauty without uh, government participation. 
and uh, without any guarantee coming from the member countries. This is uh, an option. The other option can be BOT with countries participation. And the other option can be countries only and selection of a private structure or private company to operate and manage, uh, manage the infrastructure implemented. So all this depending on the, naturally on the profitability of the section along the corridor. Some example, for example, exist that uh, in power system that we create a special purpose vehicle and or what we call, uh, well, it's in French, Société de Patrimoine. I don't know in English, is it asset companies, but in French we said Société de Patrimoine. So I think uh, this is what we, the study would determine what right. is the mode of funding of such project. I was talking about the Abidjan Lagos Corridor Management uh, Authority. We set up it, it's created, it has its, uh, its rules and procedure. We establish a board of director. We know already now, by now, the members of this board of directors. And uh, also, uh, we will take this project as a sample because we have another one from Praia, Cap Verde, okay. to Dakar, Senegal, and Abidjan. So the, all the lessons that we learn through this project will, will take it uh, for the other part, uh, right. Praia, Dakar, Abidjan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Duke. Uh, very insightful and very encouraging to hear about all these uh, ongoing projects. And obviously, let's uh, get a perspective uh, from the, the development partner, in this case, the EU, uh, calling on Mr. Sergio Uliete. Uh, now, the European Union is a key partner in supporting development, the development of regional corridors in Africa. So this is my question. What innovative approaches is the global gateway uh, considering to expedite the development of regional corridors and to overcome potential bottlenecks in implementation? One, also, how does the European Union plan to contribute to financing these large-scale projects? Thank you, Esther, and let me first thank you, the African Development Bank, for having invited us to the African Investment Forum. As uh, President Adesina has uh, highlighted in his speech, uh, the collaboration between the European Union and the African Development Bank in supporting the, region, the African Union, the regional economic communities and the countries in developing countries is, is very strong. And in, ma in many of the projects that have been uh, mentioned today, there is a a, a, a funding from the European Union, a funding in the form of grants. Uh, the European Union, uh, uh, we, we have the, the loans branch, which is the European Investment Bank. I'm representing the European Commission, who is the largest donor in the form of, of grants to supporting the, the transport sector in, 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 Sub in, Af in Sub Saharan Africa in particular. And historically, we have been uh, financing many infrastructure uh, projects. And in absolute terms, in the last years, we have even increasing the, the funding we have been providing for uh, uh, filling these gaps, making infrastructure projects bankable, and blending these grants with the loans provided by the African Development Bank, the European Investment Bank, etc. But even if in absolute terms we have increased a lot of our funding, in relative terms we have realized that uh, we are, uh, uh, our impact has, was being reduced. And, and this is normal because Africa is developing, there is more and more trade, there is more and more mobility, there is a demographic increase. So the needs for, for the demand for mobility is, is higher. So the, the, we realized that we could not continue to work as we were doing before. Uh, we, we needed to, to, to have a different approach, and that's the approach that we adopted with this e Europe-Africa uh, strategic corridors, which is a, an approach that was uh, agreed upon the African Union and the European Union at the, uh, EU, EU, uh, at the summit in, in February 2022. So we, we selected 11 corridors, now we have 12 corridors because we have added the, the Lobito corridor, and basically, there are two main drivers for this selection of but why we do, did that. As I have said, oh, in, in relative uh, terms, our, um, we realized that our impact was lower. 
uh, and that we needed to concentrate the investments in, in a limited number of corridors to have uh, a greatest, greatest impact. Instead of having uh, roads everywhere around Africa, it was more, more efficient to concentrate all investments in, in just a, a limited number of corridors. The second main driver for this new approach is that this increase in the, in the demand for transport in Africa should not necessarily imply higher uh, greenhouse emissions and higher risk for biodiversity and higher social uh, negative impacts. Uh, so we, we, we believe that the increase in transport in Africa could leapfrog to greening technologies. Railways have been mentioned here. So it was it's an opportunity for Africa to um, develop the transport systems much more sustainable. And, and we believe the corridor approach is a, is a good approach for that. So the, uh, basically, the, we choose, so for, for selecting these corridors, what we did is that we, we conducted a study with the, the, our joint research center. And because we, what, we, what was clear for us, we wanted to support the priority corridors in Africa. But as, we, as I have just said, we couldn't support everywhere. We selected uh, this limited number of, co of corridors where, where it was also a benefit for the European Union, of course. So we, we are, have choose the corridors that are a priority for Africa, but also have the most, for example, tried exchanges uh, with Europe, where we see that there is more contribution to human development, to security, uh, to protection of the biodiversity. That's why we came to a, this, this, how we came to this uh, now 12 corridors. But even like this, the corridors are, are very long, and we cannot um, uh, su support um, all the corridors. So even within the corridors, we are also trying to prioritize. And, uh, so, and then we have two main criteria for this prioritization within, for the selection of, of where our grants, we would like our grants to be supporting a specific projects. One is the additionality of our grant in terms of contribution to uh, climate uh, change mitigation and adaptation and protection of the biodiversity. So our grants are good for projects which we, where we see clearly this additionality and railway or waterways projects are very good projects for us, for example. Urban mobility projects in the city centers that are along the corridors are very good projects for us. The second uh, uh, criteria for selecting projects along the corridors is, and I will stop here, is the, the support to value change. And, and of course, we, we want to select corridors where there is this linkage between value change and with value change. And for example, is a, a, a very for us a very clear linkage is the automotive industry and critical raw materials to develop, for example, batteries uh, and in automotive industry in the countries along these corridors. So this is basically the new approach of the global gateway. Right and how we, Europe intends to be more efficient in supporting Africa in developing its corridor. Thank you. Mr. Sergio, thank you so much for that. Let's move on quickly now. And I'm always happy when I see uh, the private sector represented here because on panels, because we cannot have development on the African continent without that firm handshake, especially between the government and the private sector. So I'll come to you, Mr. Mehdi Arifi. Uh, let's talk about your perspective now. Now, Med Group uh, could play a critical role in developing regional corridors in Africa by focusing on infrastructure development, logistics, uh, trade facilitation, and fostering economic integration. Now, this is my question for you. What do you think are the key roles for uh, Tanger Med Group to contribute to the development of robust and integrated regional corridors in Africa, fostering economic growth and collaboration across borders? Uh, and if you can, please, also very important, uh, please provide examples where uh, Tanja Med has done so in Morocco. Thank you, Esther. Thank you for having me. Um, we're actually public, but I'm, uh, we're a public agency, but um, I'm very happy to share our experience. Oh. Obviously, I just want to start by extending our gratitude for uh, the invitation today and for the, uh, the platform to speak about what we're doing and how we contribute. Uh, I will start my remark um, with, um, in this very same room yesterday, President Adeshina said that he was speaking about electric vehicles, and he said that the future depended on Africa. 
I just want to add to that sentence by saying it will also depend on efficient logistics. Mm -hmm. And I take this as a remark just to also thank the African Development Bank for setting up a specific uh, panel to speak about corridors. It is of the essence. Um, uh, we spoke, uh, it was said a bit earlier about if we have to kind of um, set the picture of the African logistics maps, uh, two or three figures, trade over GDP peaks at 75%, uh, contribution of Africa in global import-export is below 5%, uh, we spoke about, it was mentioned a bit earlier, the intra-African connectivity is below 20%. And uh, while there is a great deal of infrastructure investment, uh, the, in his opening remarks, he mentioned 44 billion invested into infrastructure. I'll just mention more specifically the figure for ports. That's 50 billion that was invested between 2007 and 2017. So it means that basically it's not only about the, the investment infrastructure that you need. You need the organization and the alignment of players to deliver logistics competitiveness and ensuring that th that piece of infrastructure does impact positively in terms of spillovers. And the corridor approach is obviously a, a bright idea. And I once again thank you for, for organizing this. I think the... Um, if I were to speak very quickly about our experience, uh, we are, Tangier Med with Marsa Maroc is a developer of platform logistics, port, and industrial platforms. We are present in 24 terminals, roughly 140 million tons, and in the backyard of the port, and this is our corridor, um, um, basically we run 3,000 hectares of industrial special economic zones. And there, the... Um, if I were to speak about our contribution, I will, I will look at it from two angles. The first one is for Africa to develop, it needs efficient logistics through connectivity. President Adeshina mentioned it a bit earlier. And for that connectivity and for African contribution to grow, we need obviously Africa to be connected to the rest of the world while it's interconnected, they go together. And there, um, we fully play our role as a main hub. We are obviously the leading port in the Med as well as in Africa. We are connected to 40 ports on a weekly, 40 African ports on a weekly basis out of a total of 180 ports worldwide. So we fully play our role in making sure that Africa gets connected to the rest of the world. For our direct contribution to Morocco, uh, in Morocco, in our, in, um, in our own corridor, because we run our own corridor, it spans over a roughly four, 50 kilometers. Um, we have, it was mentioned, I'll just say specifically, it was mentioned about the automotive sector. Um, we run an industrial ecosystem within a radius of 50 kilometers that, of the port that last year did measure an output of approximately 13 billion US of value. These are industrial goods, our producer actually exported to the rest of the world thanks to the effectiveness and the efficiency of the logistics as, a por as our project is obviously, if I may say, the, the perfect conjunction of infrastructure-led development, economic development through logistics, and industrial development through infrastructure. That's how I would sum it up. And I hope I was concise enough. Yes, you were. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now let's get an actual uh, private sector perspective. Let's bring in Mr. Laboni, a CEO, uh, AGL Group. Now, the company could play a crucial role in developing regional corridors in Africa uh, by fostering by focusing on infrastructure development, logistics, trade facilitation, and fostering economic uh, integration. I, my question is, what do you think uh, are the key roles for AGL, uh, in this case, to contribute to the development of robust and integrated regional corridors in Africa, uh, fostering economic growth and collaboration across borders? Also, I'd like you, if you can, uh, please provide examples where AGL Group has done so in Africa. Thank you. First of all, I'd like uh, to thank President Adesina and to congratulate the uh, African Development Bank um, for the investment they have announced on the corridor. 
on behalf of all the users of these corridors. These investments are welcome. Uh, to, to reply to, log, to your question, I should uh, remind what are the key components of a corridor and then explain how uh, AGL is trying to match uh, the needs of the corridor. Uh, first of all, uh, you need a, a port. Then you need roads around the port to connect the ICDs around the city. Then you need roads, you need railroads, you need rivers. And at the end of the corridor, again, you need uh, ICDs, inland depot, roads, trucks, and maybe barges and train. Uh, in AGL, but uh, as Mehdi said, corridor is a lot about to align all the stakeholders of the corridor. For first, you need people to coordinate. We are, so we have uh, 23,000 employees fully dedicated to coordinate the operation on these corridors. Then you need data, because we speak about uh, transporting goods, but nowadays, data are as much important as good. And if you want to be efficient in a corridor, you should monitor the data. Uh, we operate trucks, we have uh, 2,000 trucks, we operate two railroads, we are in 20 ports, we have uh, um, 16 container terminals, six railroad terminals, uh, two break box terminals, we have more than 66 ICDs. We have two barging operations. So I would, I would uh, answer yes. We have the organization to match the expectation. Last year, we invested more than, with our partners in our GV, we invested more than 400 million euro on these corridors, uh, in warehouses, in uh, railroads, in ports. But we are, we are a private company. We are committed to develop these railroads, but there are some component and key component of the roads of the corridor that are beyond our means, even though we are very long-term players. The roads, the railroads, and I fully agree with Peter, the future is about railroad. When you know that uh, the cost of carbon, the carbon consumption for a truck is 10 times higher than the carbon consumption per rail, and as a corridor operator, believe me, it's much more easier to ship through train than to ship uh, to, to, to trucks. So um, I, I, this is my point that I want to stress out. Yes, we are a good operator. I think we are even the best one. But um, we need a strong uh, uh, in involvement all these, uh, uh, of my friends around me. And what, all what I've heard is very positive for the future. And it's difficult for me to give an example of a corridor. I would say we are able to invest in every leg on the corridor when it makes sense financially, when there is a financial return decent. So we have invested, for instance, I see Brazzaville Corridor. We have invested uh, half a billion in Point Noir Port. Tomorrow we will invest in the port of Lobito, more than 100 million in the port, but we will also invest in Luau at the border. We will invest in Colvesi in the yard in order to provide uh, decent services to all our users. At the end, what I want to say, let's unlock Africa together. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Laboni. Ms. Dina, it's a, a pleasure to have you join us. Uh, we've heard from uh, Burundi, we've heard uh, examples from uh, Angola, we've heard from uh, East Africa, ECOWAS, uh, the West African region, we've heard from uh, development partners, we've heard from the private sector. I wonder for you, just listening to the conversation so far, what is top of mind? I know that for PGII, you've also done some work with the Lobito Corridor. Just what is top of mind for you as you've listened to the perspective being shared and perhaps some key elements that we should also if you will, take into consideration as we move towards uh, building more regional corridors. You know, it's been wonderful to hear from the experience and advice from others, and I think everyone keyed in on some, some key things. One, we can't do this alone. It requires great partnership, which is why PGI starts with the word partnership. And 
on the behalf of the government, we are trying to do infrastructure differently, which also means taking more risks and sometimes operating uh, in ways that may seem uncomfortable when we're trying to do new things faster to better meet the needs and close the infrastructure gap at an accelerated pace. So this means we all need support. We need pushing from our partners. We need like-minded companies that are going to come and also take risks and stretch and invest alongside so that we can achieve all of these gains together um, and in an accelerated way so that we don't leave Africa behind. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. Uh, we've heard uh, from our panelists today uh, from across uh, the African region, including, of course, the private sector and development partners, and it's quite encouraging to hear, just to hear the, the scale of the projects uh, that are ongoing. But obviously, there's always room for improvement. We can and should have more projects, uh, and hopefully we can unlock more uh, financing to make that happen. Now, we're just going to pause here. Uh, we have about, uh, I believe, about seven minutes left. I'd like to give the audience an opportunity uh, to participate and ask uh, questions. Uh, uh, so if you would like to just uh, ask a question, let us know the your name, the organization that you represent, and to whom your question is directed at. My question is to the representative of the European Union, because he talked about the 12 corridors that they selected. Uh, is the Central Corridor Transit Transport Facilitation Agency is among uh, uh, those 12 corridors that you selected? And uh, if uh, yes, what is the status of a partnership that you have with uh, the Central Corridor? Thank you so much. Thank you. So what we'll do is take three questions. Hi. I'm Manuel Mota, I'm the deputy CEO of Mota Gil Group. We are owners of 50% of the Lobby 2 Corridor concession, and uh, we are also EPC contractors in an EPC plus finance model for the Kano Maridi, which connects the northern Nigerian to Niger. And we've been also involved in the Nakala Corridor as a contractor and of the maintenance of the railway. And I'm going to speak more about the Lobby 2 Corridor and about the Kano Maradi. In these two projects, in the Lubitu Corridor, it's a concession. So far, we've signed the contract a year ago, and we, we, we started the operation two months ago. But in reality, the only entity that has put money into the project so far has been the private entities. Uh, we are discussing the one that is most advanced is, in fact, the FC, but we are discussing with a lot of uh, uh, the, the banks and DFIs. For the, pro for the financial close, so, and giving the example also of Cano Maradi, where the project is not yet fully financed, for different reasons, the Lubitu Corridor, and the specific there has to do with security, okay? How can the, the, the government of Nigeria guarantee the security of the project long term, okay? And the reality is, in, in the case of Cano Maradi, my question is, how can we fight, in this case, extremism and terrorism that exists, in fact, in some of the region without investing? So how can we help and how can we still borrow money to the African governments to, 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 to invest in critical areas because is this type of investment in right. corridors that is going to help? And in the Lubitu Corridor, is just an example, is in terms of project finance, how can we... I, I do beg your pardon, I do apologize to interrupt, but we're, we, are, we are almost out of time. So would you like, what panelists in particular would you like to answer that question? In the Lubitu corridor, just to finalize it to 10 more seconds, how can the DFIs fast track their processes to answer to the timings and demands of the right. governments imposed on private investors? Thank you. Gentlemen, over there. Thank you. Um, I'm from Kenya, and my question is directed to the Commissar Secretary General. Railway transport pollutes less than road transport, yet we have an <laughs> SGR project that only reached Nairobi and did not go ahead to complete the transport all the way to Kampala and Uganda. So what are the plans, based on the climate um, elements that you talked about, to complete this rail project from Nairobi further into um, Uganda and Tanzania based on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the corridors that you're talking about. And secondly, 
how does this huge investment for Africa, I think when I had the Lobito Corridor, it's about 600 billion US dollars, sit with Africa's indebtedness? How will it play with social sector infrastructure, which has been neglected as we wait for the infrastructure development to take place and give us the dividends? Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have exactly three minutes. Perfect timing to answer those three questions in one minute. Uh, let's start with uh, Mr. Sergio. Uh, if I heard well, the question was about the central uh, corridor. Um, I wanted to say that uh, the, the selection of 12 corridors is a guidance. It's because we want to, to channel the, 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 our grants towards these 12 corridors. And we would like the, uh, the financial institutions, starting with the European Investment Bank, but also to African Development Bank, to submit us projects requesting for grants for these 12 corridors. Uh, and as I said, we had to, se to be selective because we, we didn't have, we wanted to, to concentrate the investments. I, I'm not going to repeat this. I think I was clear enough with this. And unfortunately, even we know the central corridor uh, in East Africa is very important, we, we didn't select it. Which doesn't mean that the EU is not working and supporting this, the, the corridor authority. We have uh, financing through GIZ, the German government is, is providing technical assistance, and also we are working on Dar in Dar es Salaam, because, in the port of Dar es Salaam, because the, the corridor, one of the 12 corridors is Dar es Salaam, uh, Nairobi, Addis, uh, Berbera, Djibouti, and, and indirectly we are also supporting then the, the central corridor, because Dar es Salaam, the port of Dar es Salaam is the gateway of the central corridor. All right, thank you very much, Sergio. Mr. Nye? I'll address both questions. Um, on the Libito corridor, uh, I realize the DFC funding is not yet closed, and this is part of the learning and the growing process for all of our governments, but certainly the U.S. government. When it does close, it will be the fastest transaction of this size that DFC has done, but it does take some time to move from the traditional speed into what we are looking to have as an accelerated pace for global infrastructure. So hold tight. It's coming soon. Um, and then speaking to the large amount of infrastructure investments, PGI is specifically designed to be private sector led where a smaller amount of concessional financing from the US government and other G7 partners can help facilitate a private sector investment such that it, it truly does minimize the debt that is taken on by the host governments and it has potentially longer duration for operations that are private sector operated, so there's operations and maintenance built in for a project like the rail. Um, and so that really is the intention behind PGI, to, to build infrastructure in a different way. All right, thank you so much. Uh, finally, Comessa, if you can thank do that in 10 seconds. Thank you. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, this has to do with, Comessa has to do with the East African community, I must, I must indicate from the beginning. Yeah. Well, SGRs are the future, definitely the future. But the problem with them is they are a bit challenging in terms of profitability. And, and of course, some of them incur huge debts, and, and I agree with, with, the, with the question, of course, it's a very relevant question. Now, we need to invest in the future, albeit with the huge uh, upscale investment in these projects and the challenge was profitability, but this is the right path to take right. for the future, SGRs. Now we're working very closely as a REC, along with other RECs, with the continental bodies like the African Union and NEPAD. We have something called PDABAP2, which is a list of projects to finance in terms of infrastructure, including railways. And of course, working very closely with it, our development partners and our pan-African financial institutions like the African Development Bank right. to support these projects. Thank you so much for that very insightful, those very insightful uh, conversations and perspective. And on that note, we've come to the end of today's uh, session. Of course, so we've been talking about regional corridors and their importance uh, in uh, integrating Africa.